What's up, Energy Fam? This is Justin, and welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. My goal with each episode is to deconstruct the minds of today's energy thought leaders to uncover their framework and tools used in their journeys of providing energy to the world. So sit back, relax, and remember that everything you see around you requires some form of energy. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. I'd like to welcome special guest and lead sponsor of the show, Miguel Pena, CEO of 10X Technologies. Miguel, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. I interviewed you while, shoot, probably over well over a year ago. Um, yeah, man. Welcome to the show. How's everything in your world? It's good, good to be back on your podcast, JG. Um, <laughs> I think it was in the middle of the pandemic the last time you and I. Um, yeah, you yeah. Know, I mean, we've seen each other a bunch of times since then, but um, yeah, in this format, I think it was, I would say, April, March, 2020. Yeah, no, and clearly lots has changed. <laughs> You've grown, uh, you know, 10X has done extremely well. Um, I got a lot more gray hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, man. <laughs> my, my daughter actually made a point of telling me that the other day. She's like, Daddy, she's like, is your beard going to go fully gray? I was like, yeah, I was like, they, I mean, the gray, the, the, the grayer, the hair, the smarter I get. So think how smart I'm going to be. And you already think I'm smart now. I'm like, dad's going to know everything, <laughs> right? That's, it's a, like, that's a great answer. I might use that one. Right. Sum up quite a bit. I, I haven't thought of a good comeback. That's a good one. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And then it's like my daughter's now she's, she's eight. Right. And so she has a comeback for everything. And now it's like, dad, come on. Really? Like she totally, she knows I like messing with her and we're always cutting up. And uh, now instead of her just believing everything I say and being like on top of the world, she's always challenging me like, dad, you're not really that strong. Are you like, just like stuff like that. I'm like, come on, what? Like I'm your superhero. I always will be. What are you talking about? <laughs> competitive one. You got a competitive one there. Yeah, no. So she, she's in softball now and she's like getting really competitive and, which is fascinating as a parent. And and I mean, you, you were telling me about your son that's in college, but like seeing going, going from like the toddler stage to like the kid stage to then like finding some passion and, and like the grit and sort of the, the, the competitiveness within a child is uh, once they start to unlock that, it's like, okay, now we're really moved hitting strides here. It's, it's super cool to see. Yeah. It's special. It's it is. special. Yeah. Speaking of kids, we're, uh, we're right around the corner from Halloween. This will get released well after Halloween, but are you, are your kid, are you, do you have any that are at the age they still trick or treat? Or are you past that point? No, we're, I still have my two youngest like to trick or treat. Okay. Um, they no longer want me to tag along. <laughs> no. So, so I don't know. It, I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, past that per se. They're still trick or treating, <laughs> but they don't need me anymore. So um, I guess I'm out of the woods more or less. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to hand out candy instead of wrangle kids around and make sure they don't get run over by crazy people. That's right. That's right. But, and I kind of, unfortunately I kind of miss it because in our neighborhood, our community is really cool. Um, most parents, you know, the dad goes out with the kids and then the moms stay back or vice versa. And then the porch is becomes like a little, not just candy, but there's some beverages that, you know, some of the, some of the neighbors have available, like, Hey dad, you want a beer? Yeah. And, you know, I usually, I usually, you know, carry a little cooler and maybe do a little, a little swap -a -roo. Yeah. Um, That's so, so cool, man. <laughs> yeah. So I don't get to participate in that anymore, but you know what, what my wife and I do now is we'll either host a little porch party or, or we'll get invited to one. So man, that's great. It's cool to have treating and then, you know, we'll sit on the porch and, yeah, have a couple of beverages and enjoy the evening. Man, Halloween is definitely not just about the kids. The parents can find ways to have fun too. I believe that. Right. No doubt. No <laughs> That's doubt. That's awesome. Well, holiday season's here, man. I mean, I I gotta ask, like, what you know, we've got Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. What what's your favorite holiday of the year? Christmas is definitely my favorite. You know, like I've always had the my rule has always been, uh, be home on Christmas Day. So if we we typically don't go away, but if we do go away over Christmas holiday, you know, we're home before uh, Christmas Eve. Yeah. You know, up in the morning, you know, breakfast, you know, coffee, kids oh, yeah. in and open gifts, you know, Man. watch, watch uh, replay some old videos from, from Christmas day when the kids were little. Yeah. 
dude, that is. I'm like, so I'm cool. like the old man from, uh, you know, from from Christmas Story or or uh, you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I'm, dude, that's I'm Chevy Chase. Hundred percent. I'm so with you on that. Like my wife and I, we we watch that on reruns probably at least three to four times every holiday season. We'll watch National Lampoon's, and uh, man, I'm I'm such a geek for like the decorations, the old school music. Like I I love new music and like the latest trends in music. But when it comes to Christmas music, dude, I'll play the throwbacks from like this like the '60s and '50s, man. I just like something about it, man. The magic of Christmas, wow. not but. It's it's around the corner. The decorations are out. Well, shit, they've been out since like June. I feel like in some places, but I am getting fired up for the holiday season, man. So uh, I'm. It's yeah. It's a good time of year. Um, but uh, yeah, before we, we, oh, have some, we have some Christmas stuff already out. You know the, the doormats. Oh, yeah. You know my oh, wife starts. She what? starts to like. She starts to like. You know drizzling in over time, and it's. it's <laughs> nice dude that is, that is great i love it man do you guys have lights up already too outside not, not yet but they're going okay up. yeah i was about to say man like you're after okay yeah, after <laughs> that's cool man that's uh i couldn't for some reason for over the years i could never figure out there was always some houses that had lights up already but come to find out it's actually diwali that is a holiday celebrated um and yes. and and actually having lights up is to celebrate that but i could i was like why do these people always have it and then so i looked i'm like is there a holiday like around this time of year and come to find out it was diwali so at first i was like you guys are way too ahead of it. i was like there was the only decorations up i'm like you have lights up but nothing else like what's the deal and uh anyway yeah. diwali is kind of a cool holiday actually so big, big <laughs> indian festival absolutely we have a, a really close friend of ours is indian who, who has a, a diwali celebration dinner Added, oh heck added. yeah we all put on our you know to the best of our ability our you know colorful gear yeah. um and attire and and have go have a nice meal it's nice uh, that's super it's cool man. hell yeah that's great um well first before we kick things off and chat business i really do want to extend my sincerest gratitude for sponsoring this show um i'm really pleased to represent you guys um you're an amazing company who's truly solving some of the most complex challenges in oil and gas production so for the listeners None of this would be possible, none of the content uh, without the sponsorship. And so, again, Miguel, appreciate you, the team, Kate, everybody. Um, really mean that. So for for the listeners out there, check them out. 10X is, is doing some phenomenal stuff, which we'll get in here, uh, get into it soon. And so I, I guess curious, Miguel, like not necessarily specifics to to our sort of the sponsorship we have, but like as a company, why why is it important for those to get out there and whether it's sponsor a podcast or just continue building their brand in social media world um what, what's the value there and i mean is that because obviously that's sort of part of your guys' strategy but what would would you encourage other companies to kind of get on that wagon too or what does that look like for you guys hey everyone sorry to interrupt but this episode is sponsored by 10x technologies pushing the boundaries of chemistry 10x is innovating the future of the oil and gas industry with their proprietary materials based technology solutions with cutting edge products like NanoClear, custom designed nanofluids engineered to maximize the production of new completions and rejuvenate existing wells, 10X is driving a revolution in oil extraction. Meet Microhold, a specially engineered microparticle slurry that optimizes frac efficiency, props microfracs, and triggers far field diversion every well, every time sees the benefits. And if you're worried about frac hits, 10X has you covered with no hit. An innovative technology that mitigates frac hits via in situ pressurization reaction. It's protection where you need it most. Then there's Sandbond, a sand consolidation chemical solution that's just another example of 10X's commitment to practical field-ready solutions. And let's not forget about Seraflow, a greener, cost-effective, proprietary blend of design materials to banish paraffin issues once and for all. That's 10X, where innovation meets application in the oil and gas industry. Find out more about their groundbreaking solutions at pumpmoreoil.com. And be on the lookout for five. Yeah, you heard it. Five new products launching soon. Now, let's get back to the show. Yeah, that's a great question. And look, you know, the, the, there's an obvious answer, which is, you know, first of all, I've always had a lot of respect for you. You're you're a great oil and gas ambassador. You have you have um, you're just a super likable guy. I've always told you that. And you got a great following, right? Everybody who knows you loves you. So why <laughs> wouldn't anyone want to not, you know, not be associated with, with you and your platform. So th that's the obvious one. Um, yeah, you know, thank you. But there's, there's, you know, there's many, right. So you yeah. have to, 
but we pick and choose wisely. And, and for me personally, you know, I like to align myself with, with, you know, people who are like-minded, who kind of share the same values, um, you know, not just on a personal level, but also, you know, as it relates to the industry. And, you know, I've always felt like, you know, I, I, there's a lot of alignment there. So yeah. I could list, you know, 50 reasons why we picked you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the other thing is, you know, we got to support, you know, our own, right? You know, the people in the industry, they're trying to build a business and trying to, you know, trying to grow. And, you know, whenever we can play a part in helping that happen, to me, that's just, that's just building, you know, a really good, uh, really good network and, and really good karma. Yeah. So, you know, all no, those I, things are important. Well, I'm, I'm humbled and I, and I hate, you know, well, I don't hate, I, I like, I appreciate the, the compliments, but what I think you sort of the bigger picture too, is to kind of add what you're talking about is like, by supporting each other in the business, there's a lot of fascinating people doing fascinating things within our space, just like you guys. And when you're in a position to help others and to support others, like for me, I think I have somewhat of a responsibility to like bring people on, get them to tell their stories, get them to share some of the fascinating technologies that they're working on, or some of the things that some of the initiatives that they're working on, because for so long, like our messaging has been challenged by so by the just media in general. And there's a lot of like, like such good people working to help some of the world's problems, which is providing energy to the world. And so it's like, if we can all come together and support each other, it's not always about the bag or the or the money. It's it's about like, how can we as an industry, just support each other and get our message out there, communicate what we're doing, uh, hopefully on a large scale. Because um, ultimately, that's what's going to help this sort of this energy landscape that we're challenged with day in and day out. And the reality is the demand for energy ain't going anywhere um, and neither is fossil fuels. And so if, if we can humanize and have platforms like mine and there's tons, you know, you've got JP Warren, you've got flipping the barrel, you got the digital wildcatters. There's like, you know, OGGN, there's a, there's a ton of us and way more uh, probably now than, than I even listed. But again, I think it's important for all of us to support each other and, and like you said, it's karma. It all comes back around, right? If you're willing to support others and do the right thing, uh, hopefully good things will come back in return. So I just, I, I wanted to sort of touch on that. And again, appreciate that. Um, and speaking of, of products and technology and all that kind of stuff, I want to come out of the gate to talk about some really exciting news that you shared with me regarding one of your guys' top products. Um, I mean, you have a solution to a very common problem and with the recent success, you've managed to unlock some serious value for customers. So can you kind of share the, the problem and the challenge that you guys identified and then how you created uh, the product and, and ultimately where the value lies for the operator beyond that? Yeah, sure. No, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, look, I think I went back and listened to, to the podcast that you and I did, you know, back in, in 2020. And, I, and one of the comments that I made that stuck out for me, um, this time around listening to it was, you know, I think I, I, I don't remember the exact words, but it was like, you know, Justin, I know we've made it as a company when our customers are calling us with a yeah. problem and asking us to develop a solution. And, you know, I'm proud to say that we've, we've made, we, we're at that point now where customers have actually reached out to us and said, hey, we have this issue. We've tried several different uh, technologies or products in the marketplace. They're just not working you know, can you develop something? And, you know, as of today, I would tell you 70 to 80% of the products that we have in our portfolio um, all came out of a request from a customer or a conversation that we had in a meeting that was unrelated to this particular product. We were, you know, promoting another product or they had another problem we were working on. And then in that conversation, out of that conversation came another problem. We went, you know, to the lab and, and developed the solution. So now have we made it, made it per se? I would argue no. We still got a long way to go, um, but but our customers, uh, you know, the money's not coming in yet. But but I think our customers, the trust that our customers have in 10x, um, and and our ability to really deliver real solutions, I think um, we've come a long way on that front for sure. So yeah, recently That's... is with our with our sand control technology, which um, you know, with as with almost all our technologies, it's always an iterative process. Right. You know, it's not one size fits all. You know, we're not going to develop a sand control product that's going to work in every single well. Um, you know, and what ends up happening more often than not is we end up coming up with 
you know, two, three, five different kind of formulations of the same fundamental technology. And then you eat the formula, you know, the application and the well and the reservoir kind of, it all depends which formula is going to work. And we have to do, you know, quite a bit of lab testing to figure out which one is optimal. Um, you know, so we launched Sandbond uh, in 2019, obviously had a little bit of a setback when the pandemic hit, but then shortly thereafter, um, interest in the, in the technology was really high. Um, you know, it's a real problem, you know, operators spend millions, uh, tens of millions of dollars a year, uh, in dealing with sand control. It's a global problem. So it's not exclusive to the Permian or, you know, the U S or just Canada. I mean, it's everywhere, uh, pretty much in every major oil and gas basin in the world. And, you know, there's no real solution for it. Um, and we have a, a product that through multiple trials and iterations and, uh, we've kind of figured out how to, uh, at least one application where, where it can be very effective. And so we're really excited about that. Um, that's fairly recent, hot off the press. And you know, we're going to continue to monitor that well. The operator that um, trialed the product, um, you know, what, what's most exciting about it is these, this was a, it was a P&A well. This operator has many wells earmarked for plug and abandon. Uh, so not producing anything. Mm. And, they, we've been able to, you know, clean out the well bore, pump our sand bond technology and get that well to start producing oil. So, so what's really interesting about this particular trial, Justin, is this, this well had not produced any oil since 2013. The operator uh, was struggling with this well because it kept sanding up. The well bore would fill up with sand. They'd have to go in, shut it in, clean it out, and then bring it back onto production. And then within a week, it would sand up again. So they finally just decided the cost was was too too big uh, and they shut it in permanently hadn't produced oil since 2013 they've tried a couple other solutions they evaluated some others to no avail and uh, you know sandbond did the job so it's really really exciting it's a groundbreaking technology and uh, this well currently now is producing between 15 and 20 barrels of oil a day no sand um, and it went from from producing zero revenue to now a revenue stream of, you know, somewhere between 400 and $500,000 a year, which is really, really amazing. That's impressive, especially in today's environment. Yeah, it's really exciting. And so we're excited about that technology and we're looking forward to uh, implement it across several other basins uh, with, with all the customers that have expressed an interest. So, and, and by the way, it's in, it's in your home country in Canada. Oh, nice. Okay. There we go. That's great yeah, to hear, man. I love that. Really exciting. Yeah. So um, if you can kind of describe, so what would be like the criteria for an operator is like, I'm having X problem. Yes. I have issues with sand. Yes. I mean, is there kind of like an ideal well or candidate that would, that would then permit Sambon to work effectively? Cause like, obviously there's different well profiles, there's different con sand content, whatever that looks like. But like, what, what, how would you describe like the ideal candidate, if you will? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, and it's a complex issue, right? Because you, okay. know, you can have, you can have a, an old vertical well that's producing sand and you can have, you know, a modern, you know, two mile lateral that's producing sand. So this technology is unique in the sense that um, unlike other sand consolidation uh, products and methodologies, this chemistry actually is effective not only for prop and flow back or, or as a frac sand flow back, it's also very effective uh, in unconsolidated sand reservoirs where you actually have formation sand coming up the well bore. Um, so, so the product is effective for both applications, which is, um, you know, is makes it fairly unique in terms of other sand control additives that are out in the marketplace. The product works. We know it works, right? We know we can get sand to bond. The question is, can you get it to bond the sand to bond? Can you get the product squeezed into the right location in the perfect spot to get the sand to bond? So it's all about placement. It's all uh -huh. about getting the product, the, the chemistry um, in the right kind of area of the fracture. Um, or the, if it's an open hole well, or if it's a, you know, an old conventional well, you just want to get it in, in the right area. It, getting, placing it is, is the challenge. 
right? Uh-huh. And, and it's so it's much easier to do that um, in a conventional well than it is in a, in a large horizontal well. For obvious reasons, right? So, in a large horizontal wall, you're going to need some type of, you know, pool or mechanical tool to isolate and make sure you can get the product squeezed in. But uh, we're pretty confident that, you know, with with the right design and the proper, you know, mechanical tools, you can that are, you know, not super expensive. Um, you can actually place the product and get it to work, you know, in, in just about any application. But gotcha. again, you know, back to the point I mentioned earlier. You know, it's an iterative process and it's going to take some tweaking along the way. Typically, you know, we say to operators, we want to partner with you to solve this problem. Or if you expect us to do it in the first well, and, and if we do it in the first one, it works. We got lucky, right? Yeah. We, we need, you know, multiple wells and we need you to be committed to solving this problem just as much as we're committed to being the solution provider. Yeah, and work together to 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 really come up with the the solution. And when we have that type of relationship, it, it's almost guaranteed success. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you find a lot of like over the years have operators been more willing to do sort of that? Hey, we understand there's going to be challenges at first, but we're we're willing to play the long game. Or are people still like, I want immediate ROI, or else? Is that shifted at all? I would say yes and no. I look, I think the pandemic um, created an environment where operators really had the opportunity to go back and study a lot of the data. They had mm. a lot more free time to do that. So I think the mindset coming out of the pandemic has 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 shifted a bit in our favor, right? Um, you know, more more progressive, more open to finding solutions that can solve problems that cost them a lot of money. Um, but I will tell you, there's always exceptions and it really depends on, on the company, right? If you're a, if you're an operator that is, you know, really focused on, you know, 30, 60, 90 day IP, because you're going to sell the asset, you know, probably not our customer, right? Okay. Uh, Makes sense. If you're an operator that's looking, you know, that's, that's looking to, for, for, you know, long-term, um, you know, hold of your assets and you're, you're, you're trying to build the best wells you can, because, you know, what, what this well does, you know, three, five, 10, 20 years from now is important to, to your, your, uh, your balance sheet, then, then yeah, you're going to be a little bit more focused on, um, you know, really building a great asset long-term as opposed to, you know, something that's short-term, you know, and, yeah. and like, we're going to, we're going to do the best we can, we're going to complete the best wells that give us the best IP in the first 90 days. And then, you know, we'll let somebody else who acquires it from us deal with the long-term stuff. Mm-hmm. So. That makes sense. I, it's in, interesting. I, it kind of popped in my head. You were mentioning earlier is like, you know, it's, it, it it's definitely, you got to be patient, especially running a business like yourself. You came in, obviously the pandemic kind of threw a wrench into things. And you're like, you said, like you're still working towards the ultimate goal um, which is to ride into the sunset and, and, you know, have money falling out of your pockets. But the crazy thing is, is like a lot of, like, I, I, I was listening to something the other day and you know, the energy drink Celsius, I'm sure you've seen it like in every sure. gas. And everything. So I, I thought they just came on the scene like a few years ago, but come to find out they're like a 25 year old company and, and hopefully it t- takes less time than 25 years, but they were like kind of in the back seat, just chugging along for years. And all of a sudden, Monster had to, and Coca Cola made some agreement where they had to change their distribution sort of format to where it like opened up shelf space, and then Celsius just happened to slide right in. But I say all that to say is like, over the last like couple of years, their stock went up like four thousand percent, and everyone thinks they're a new company, but they've been around for so long. And so it kind of goes back to that, like overnight success takes ten years. And so I, I commend you for just like you know grinding it out and being committed and keep tr- like basically just like put in the work and know that it's going to take a while. I mean, nothing happens overnight. And the things that do happen overnight typically have been working in the background for years. That's so, right. yeah. So, so true. And, and look, to use your words, I certainly hope it doesn't take us 25 years to become successful, <laughs> right? but, but you know, 10, I can live with, we're about, we're about six or seven into that first 10. Okay. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, We've now graduated from startup phase. Um, you know, when you're selling kind of new, innovative 
disruptive technologies that um, you know are more or less unproven. It yeah. takes time. You know, it's a long sales cycle. It's a long adoption cycle. You know, uh, you know we have, you know, we we have um, a great sales team. They do an incredible job of going out there and really promoting our products and getting trials. Um, but it's not like oh, you get a trial, the product worked, and then you know within thirty days, this customer is pumping it in every well. It doesn't work that way. Right. You know, really long. You know, trials are. You know, you're doing multiple trials. You're you're trying it across different assets. Um, you know, so you're doing multiple wells in one asset and they're like, okay, well, let's go try it in this other asset here. Cause we think it could drive value here. And then they do some wells there and then they take a step back and start evaluating the data and monitoring the progress of the well and seeing how the product actually performed. Um, you know, and then eventually you get to a full adoption phase, but you know, that takes time, you know, yeah. and, and we want to be very careful that, you know, we, we continue to deliver value for customers because, you know, it only takes one well where your product doesn't do well yeah. and you're starting all over again. Um, Ugh. You know, it's... and our big thing is do no harm, right? You know, we, if, if, if the product has any potential of doing harm to a well, you know, we just, we throw it in the trash and start all over again. You know, that's what we tell our, our R&D team. Yeah. No, to your that's point, it's, it's, it's... That. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a stair step up. And it's an elevator down, right? Like it's just, it's, you work so hard to get the wins and then one tiny bobble, it can just, it, it, it can, it can be devastating. And, and I've been part of it. I mean, even in my world, it's the same thing. You can drill a hundred good wells and then the one that doesn't go so well, um, totally changes the trajectory. So I, I can appreciate and admire your guys' patience and sort of precision and strategy on how you do things. And I'm, yeah, you know, I'm curious. And for the entrepreneurs out there that are listening, um, and whether you're a startup or kind of past that point, like you had, like you'd been at this now for, like you said, six years, but how do you maintain that level of, I wouldn't even say motivation, but more so just discipline to just get up and grind every single day. It's, it sounds cliche, but I mean, the reality is, is most people would, a lot of people would just end up saying, you know what, like, I just can't do this anymore. Like I've done it for years. I feel like I've worked more in part, you know, for minimum wage or whatever the case is. At least that's what my wife says in her business. But, you know, I keep pushing her to move forward. But like, what, what's your sort of sauce or what's your sort of mindset waking up thinking it's just like, why am I doing this? Like, why is it? What is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Uh, another good question. I, I don't know. I've asked myself that, you know, what, what, keeps me going in this business with, you know, so many, like so many failures, right? It's like, you need, you need like a hundred failures to get, you know, one successful, one successful customer and trial that says, yeah, we're going to pump this, um, in every single well. And it's, it's a long process. You feel like you're just getting your butt kicked every day. And then, you know, in every day you get a little bit closer to that, you know, that, that win. Um, I think it's more, I think it's the people. I think, you know, when I think about what we do, what we're creating and, and the, the people on our team, like, I just really enjoy working with, with our people. Uh, we're not a big company, you know, it's not like I have, you know, 200 employees, you know, we're 30 people. Yeah. Total. Um, you know, I, I enjoy getting out in front of customers. I enjoy spending time with our sales team. You know, I have a lot of respect for every one of them. Um, and, and a lot in common with them because that's what I did for the majority of my career. I was in their shoes. You know, I built yeah. my entire career in sales. So, um, you know, I think spending time with them and, you know, enjoying the, the, the fruits of their labor and enjoying the, the wins with them. I just, I get a lot of, a lot of joy in one of my best friends in the business is our CTO. He's our chief technology officer, Amir Radwan. He's, you know, more or less the inventor of most of our technologies if he didn't invent it um he certainly invented how to apply it in an oil and gas application right so wow. uh we've been working together for over 10 years now and uh you know love working with him you know so yeah. so i think i think it really comes down to the people you know if so true man i, I wouldn't be able to do it otherwise you know yeah. i would probably find another another job i'd find another gig yeah no, you know, the, and again, our industry, regardless of how much automation and technology gets applied, we are a people's business. We're dealing, we're solving problems face-to-face -face with customers, a lot of conversations, a lot of consultative selling. 
Um, and to your point, like when you're building a team, like obviously you've got your ride or dies that have been there since day one, but how do you in like in today's market where at least from my observation, the talent pool is is quite small. How do you go about identifying the right people? And how do you go about managing whether or not to keep someone? Because when you're small, you you every dollar and penny counts. And I mean, it does in any business, but it's a lot more visible when you're smaller. Like, how do you navigate building the team and knowing when to keep moving forward with individual or when to be like you know what like we can't we keep going like this like how, how do you approach that from like a sort of mindset perspective or strategy it's it's the, probably i would say it's the single hardest part of my job is is really finding um attracting and and retaining talent but also finding the right talent you know and you have to be objective which is why it makes it so hard right because i'm I'm in this role where I have to, I'm forced to be objective because it's all about the bottom line, right? But my personality type is quite the opposite, right? You know, I'm an emotional guy. I build connections with people. I build relationships with people, you know, the people that I work with every day. Like, you know, I always say like, I want to work with people that I feel that I want to go have a beer with after work, right? Right. You know, or go share, go share a nice meal with. And if, and if I don't have if, if I don't have that desire, then they're probably not going to be the right fit for the the, comp- the culture that I'm trying to build. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard when you, you know, you want to build a culture that's, you know, high energy, work hard, play hard, um, you know, have fun, love what you do. If you love what you do, it's not work, you know, all the cliche things. When you're building that culture or trying to build that culture and you're trying to bring in the best talent, you know, there comes a point where you have to make a really tough, objective decision. And yeah. sometimes, you know, you got to be careful that, you know, you know, blur the lines between, you know, business and personal. So, so really, I asked myself two questions. It's, are they the right fit for the role, right? If we were, if we were making a gazillion dollars and money was no object, you know, is this the person that would be the right, the perfect person for this role? Um, and then the second thing is, is the timing right? Right. So do we need that role right now? And, right. and, and we've made that mistake many times where I've hired the perfect person for the role and, you know, the growth that we were anticipating didn't quite happen as quickly as we hoped. And I was probably, it was a, it was a premature hire, you know, and I had to make a tough decision. Um, that's, that's happened, you know, yeah. a few times already, um, you know, the opposite has happened too, where you just realize that they're just not the right fit for the role. And then it's an easy, easy decision. Um, right. But it's always hard, regardless of what the answer that, to those two questions are, because, you know, you, you quickly build a, a really strong rapport and relationship, you know, with, with these folks that are on your team. And, you know, yeah. if, you have, if you have any sense of, you know, care for about people and their livelihood, yeah. you know, it's, it's very difficult. You know, it's hard. It's the hardest. It. No, I've I've heard that from several folks, and I, I've never really been in a position in my career where I've had to like hire and fire a bunch of people. And so, but I know I remember during like the 2014 16 era where there was you know bloodshed, and then obviously the pandemic. Like the amount of like I've seen managers and and leaders stress, but when those times came, like it like it was like the life was sucked out of them, and they just. Like they don't mind getting chewed out by a customer, but when they have to go tell someone that they've built a relationship with and they've got an emotional tie with, and maybe they've met the family and they know people, and then it's like you have to tell them like, "Hey, I'm gonna have to let you go." It's like I, I again, I couldn't imagine. I, I know I'm similar to you. Is like I, I build strong relationships with people, and I'm very empathetic, and I, I really get like tied into people's, uh, you know, emotions quite well. I could just imagine how hard it'd be for me to have to let someone go. I think it'd be, <laughs> it'd be the, probably the hardest conversation I've had. And so it's, yeah. uh, I commend you for like putting yourself in that role, man. Like it's again, not, not very many people can do it and maintain it and everything else. But uh, it, yeah, again, it's, it's part of running a business. And um, again, there's only a few out there that have the, the nuts to do it. So you can pat yourself on the back, man, <laughs> taking a quick pivot. Uh, so when regards to like products and technology, are, are there any common themes right now within the space that 
the challenges that that wells are facing maybe because we're moving from tier one to tier two or maybe different reservoirs i mean is there any sort of trends or themes out there that you're seeing that are, are worth acknowledging and things that maybe you guys are working on on the product side yeah yeah no absolutely i would say it's it's the operational efficiencies you know of, of any kind but as it relates to the wells especially it's it's cluster efficiency frack efficiency you know getting in and out of stages quicker saving time on the on on location uh you know these are all the things that have become you know pretty popular i would say Interesting. Uh, in the industry and and we've kind of learned it by accident you know we developed this this product called microhold um another shameless plug on one of our technologies but no oh, it's good um, you know, we developed that product. Um, it's a it's a micro particle slurry. It's an engineered quality silica substrate that we. Uh, I say we. I didn't do anything. Our our technology, our R and D technology team came up with a shear thinning suspension agent that allows us to those ah. particles stay suspended in a fluid. It's water based, right? So it's compatible with just about everything you can possibly think of that gets pumped in a well. Um, and again, placement, right? Allows you to pump it fairly easily. That product initially, Amr developed it as a as a, a lower cost alternative to micro ceramics, right? Which are wow. you know very good product, but but it's also a very costly, very expensive product. And um, so we developed it for long term enhanced recovery, right? But I can tell you, we don't. I think we have one customer right now that even cares about that benefit. You know, they all yeah. buy it for the operational efficiencies. It's a great scouring agent. It helps you get to rate quicker. Um, oh. Helps you. Get put away stages faster. Um, it's great for cluster efficiency. It could be used as a far field diverter. Um, it could be used for, for uh, frack hit mitigation. I mean, there's, it's got all these operational benefits that make really help sell the product because it's, you know, those, those results are fairly instant. You don't have to wait, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 months to see what the production looks like, you know, is that's what it takes. And you don't really, you can't, measure the production benefit um, to at least six months or more, right? Okay. You know, and b before then, it's impossible to measure. There's too many variables. A lot of the fractures haven't even fully closed yet. A lot of the micro fractures are still, you know, have fluid in them. So uh, right. you really got to wait long. It's a long-term, literally long-term uh, enhanced mm -hmm. recovery that, you know, you can measure, but you got to wait several months to, to get the data. Whereas right. the benefits have really helped sell the product and you know and it's because that's the, the really the common theme that we're hearing out in the marketplace it's all about you know cluster efficiency has become such a such a uh, you know two words that are you know super common across every conversation we have with operators that everybody's interested in that interesting and so a lot of the products that you're that you're talking about are they continuously pumped or are they pumped like and batches or how is this stuff normally applied? Depends on the product. The sand bond is just one treatment, right? The sand control one. Okay. Just, you know, you pump a few totes, you know, either per stage or if it's a if it's an old conventional well, you know, a few totes, you know, in an activator, place it, shut the well in for, you know, 12 hours and then open her up and see what happens. Uh, but micro hold is, is uh, you're pumping it in every stage, right? So it's a new completion additive. Uh, typically pump it either as a pill or in a pad, uh, pad stage. So you're pumping it ahead of your sand stages, trying to get into those secondary arteries that, um, you know, where frac sand. Gotcha. Even the finest frac sand can't fit. And gotcha. getting that, that, you know, that, that additional, um, additional benefit. Perfect. Okay. That makes sense. So I'm curious, how do you stay relevant and adaptive in such a dynamic market? Because completions technology, I, from my understanding, changes quite rapidly. Or like, there's always things moving and changing. I mean, is it just like staying in front of customers, or, or is it resources, or like, how do you again, like, how do you stay in front of the curve? So I would say number one is is staying in front of customers and asking questions and listening to what they have to say. You know. We tell our sales team all the time, it's like, just do more listening, you know, ask, you know, be inquisitive, ask questions. But then once you ask the question, listen, yeah. and, and then, you know, 
letting them know that the value, the value in that information they bring back is critical to the growth of the organization. It mm. really is. And you know, that yep. goes back to you know, almost all our products came from a conversation with a customer. Like we, we repeat that often to our, to our sales team. Like, Hey guys, like this product was developed because we had this meeting with this operator and they said they had this problem. And then we went back to the lab and he, we created this product, this technology, and then they pumped it and they loved it. You know, yeah. that was all because a salesperson, you know, set up a meeting, right. <laughs> with a, with an operator and asked, you know, good questions and listened. Yeah. And so, so we rely heavily on our sales team to kind of bring back that, that, um, that information from, from the field and from the high rise office, like the one you're sitting in right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. Houston. Yeah. Uh, you know, that information is critical. It's critical to our business and, you know, it's, it's, it's driven a lot of the, a lot of the growth. Level. And I would argue almost every product that we have in our portfolio. Yeah, no, you, you bring up a good point. And if there's salesmen listening, it's, I think it's critical to key in on it is, is, is a sales rep. It's like product dumping and, and spec dumping on somebody is, is oftentimes never a winning solution. But if you can really be a good listener, listen with intent, ask the right questions. Um, it's again, it sounds cliche, but there's a real art to it. And if you really pay attention customers will often tell you exactly what you need. And then all you got to do is get back to the drawing board and, and come up with that solution. And, and, and then, and then being able to articulate the value or like the de-risking or how much money they'll save or whatever the case is. Um, again, there's, 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 there's some, some definitely some framework that is, if applied can make your job so much easier instead of just either taking the shotgun effect or being, you know, just not even knowing the customer's problems and just being like, Hey, we have this product and this is what it does. And then next thing you know, the guy's like, well, the, the, yeah, great. But that doesn't really apply to my well. Like, I don't know. So why are you here? <laughs> you know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing worse than, you know, you get 20 minutes into a meeting and then you find out that the customer doesn't have a need for the product, whatever it is that you're trying to sell. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, we yeah. talk a lot about that, you know, and, our, we tr and we do some pretty, you know, pretty heavy training, uh, right. informal training with our sales team, you know, just to remind them that, you know, you really have to be, um, you have to want to understand what your customer really needs. And then, so we try to, we try to train them to, to go in and, and talk about the problems, right? Like these are the problems that we're seeing in the, in the marketplace. These are some of the problems that most of our customers are dealing with. Are you dealing with any of these? Yeah. And then based on the answer, then they can tailor you know, the presentation to, you know, one or two of the products versus nine, right. Yep. Um, figure out what are the one or two products that are really going to, they're going to be interested in, you know, and that's yep. really the first 10, 15 minutes of the meeting, just trying to understand, okay, we have this wide portfolio of products that have all different applications. Some may apply, some don't help me understand which ones, you know, maybe the right fit for your operations. Um, but the hardest thing is, I would tell you the hardest thing is, is, and, and we've been very fortunate. We have a, we have really, really talented salespeople on our team, you know, that are, you know, technical, but, you know, can sell and, and know how to listen. Um, the hardest thing is trying to find salespeople that, that genuinely have the intellectual curiosity, mm. really understand what their customers are dealing with and what they really, what are the problems, you know, like yep. that. That's, that's the hardest thing to find. And we've been very fortunate to, you know, just about everyone on our sales team has that, you know, just that's, natural inclination, that natural desire to really get to know and understand the customer and do the homework, do the research before you go in the meeting, you know, and then, mm -hmm. and then it makes, it makes selling a lot easier. And then it's not really selling. It's, it's, it's more consultative selling, as you mentioned earlier. And, you know, I think our customers really appreciate that. No, that's, that, that's actually very true. And one thing that I've, I just hit my head against a wall so many times is like going into a meeting. And a lot of times the first and second one is like, you really try to ask the right questions and get them to admit problems that they're having. But it's like, most times it's like, no, yeah, everything's going great. It's like, really? Like, there's nothing that's bugging you right now? No, everything's good. I mean, yeah, if it was cheaper, but you know, everything else is good. And then it like, after like four or five months, you come to find out like, behind you know they've been having all kinds of hell and it's like man why wouldn't you just admit it like you don't have to make it seem like everything's okay like i'm trying to help you <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah 
no, it's hard. It's hard to get, you know, people to admit that they're <laughs> yeah. that anything's going wrong in their world. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah, funny. Great. Yeah. That's what uh speaking of R and D, um, do you have any other exciting uh products coming down the pipeline or or anything that's worth mentioning that that you guys are coming up with? Yeah, yeah. So we launched um our full stem suite of products, which is really designed. We don't do uh we don't do any commodities, right? Um, but we're trying to what we're trying to do is use our expertise in nanotechnology, so true nanoparticle technology, to try and come up with um you know basically uh, improve some of the commodity products that are already on the marketplace. So you know just about every well in the world deals with like one of four problems, whether it's like, you know, paraffin and acetine or corrosion or scale or, or they have gel damage or, you know, so, so we're trying to target, you know, those four or five kind of super common problems in the oil field that are global issues that they deal with. And then trying to apply nanotechnology, um, you know, and the science of nanotechnology to create, you know, a better paraffin, asphaltine, you know, uh, product, a better corrosion uh, inhibitor, a better scale breaker, a uh, better gel breaker. Um, you know, nanoparticles can really work wonders, you know, in the, within the right formula um, and on, in the right environment. They could really, you know, improve the performance of, you know, traditional commodity chemicals. So trying to really apply some science and technology around those products and then, um, you know, again, deliver a better, you know, a better solution for our customers. So that's yeah. our full century products. Um, you know, Sarah Flo, I re- appreciated your last podcast with uh, Josh Sigler of, of XCL because they're dealing with that waxy crude in the, in the Uinta and we're very active right now uh, having multiple conversations with operators and, and then you went to dealing with waxy crude with our Sarah Flo. Oh, wow. um, awesome. And Sarah is, we went, we had a lot of different ideas on what we should name that particular technology. And we came up with Sarah. I like Sarah because Sarah is actually um, Latin for wax. Ah, yeah. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super creative. I love that. It's, uh, and it, and it comes off the tongue well, too. I mean, Sarah Flo, it's, it's it, from a marketing perspective, I think scaled it. Yeah. No, that's right. super cool. So no, the full stem suite of products is really focused on the production side, whereas we've, you know, leading up to this suite of products, it was mostly uh, completion uh, chemicals that we were we were providing to the marketplace. Fascinating. Well, it sounds like you guys are hard at it. I'm sure your lab and R&D department and technology group is like working tirelessly to get this out the door and and, and just keep providing value for the customers. Um, besides your products that are trending, uh, talk about your son's music that's trending because I think that's pretty cool and I think it's worth mentioning. Talk about that. I appreciate you asking, and I'm going to sound like a like a very proud dad for, <laughs> for the next minute or so. But yeah, yeah. I have uh, my oldest son is a, now a sophomore uh, in college. He's at Belmont University in Nashville. What better better place to be? Big big music school. Yeah, uh, he's majoring in music business and production, and he wants to be a producer. So he makes music. He can play instruments, but he he makes music. So he sends me his SoundCloud, and he's like, "Dad, you got to hear, you know, my new track." So sure yeah. enough, I, it's like, you know, he he wrote the lyrics, um, he what? wrote the music, he played every instrument on the song except for the drums, who a buddy of his bandmate played. Um, he Damn. pretty much he produced the entire song and you know, using technology, you can kind of lay down the baseline and then it's really fascinating. But so he makes this song, it's called Gambling Man. Great song, great lyrics. Yeah. So I, I call him up, I'm all excited. I'm like, I'm like, hey bud, um, amazing song. I love it. I'm curious, like who, who sang the lyrics? And he's like, me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't know you could sing. I didn't know you could sing. I'm like, and it's like, there's no auto tune or anything. I'm like, that's actually really you. And then like, you have to go back and listen to it. And, and I'm like, what? holy, you know what? Like, that's unbelievable. He actually, the kid can sing too. So wow. I don't know where he gets any of this talent from. It's not from me. It's not from, <laughs> his, not from his mother. Neither one of us uh, are musically gifted the way he is. But, you know, we're very wow. proud. And Good for him. 
about his future uh, career in music? Well, I, I mean, as a parent, my my daughter, she's big into music. She loves singing. If she's at home, unless she's like doing something specific, if she's just kind of like in her own space, she's singing nonstop. And my son, who's four, he always like it drives him nuts. He's like, stop singing, Royce. It's so annoying. And I'm like, no, dude, like let her sing. Like that's her creativeness, yeah. like speaking. I'm like, just let her go. And dude, she'll she'll sing for like hours, man. It's so funny. Like just in her own room or like if she's doing something or like whatever. It's uh yeah, it's cool. And so like it's interesting because you know, for a long time there was a generation where it was like, you gotta go to school to become, you know, you gotta go to college and you gotta be like do accounting or finance or business or uh, engineering or law or you know what I mean? But like I commend you to like encourage him if that's what he wanted to do is like to pursue music. Cause I have a family member who grew up liking music, but his parents forced him to take accounting. And um, I think he forever resents it. And uh, he could have crushed music, but instead it was like, no, do the safe thing. Well, nowadays you can make money off your phone and 18 other different ways. So the going the safe route is not always the best route. So, uh, man, I, I wish him nothing, but I don't, and I know you have other kids, but, uh, it's just cool to hear that. I know he's, he's in college now doing his thing. And so we'll have to, we'll put the link in the show notes to, to the song there. Hopefully we can get him some more engagement and some views and listens. We'll do. I'll send you to SoundCloud. And I appreciate the yeah. comment about really, you know, supporting his passion for music, which, which Hell we noticed yeah. at a young age. I mean, okay, he was, he was six years old and telling me which songs to put on, you know, from his from the car seat in the back seat, he would tell me, dad, like play, play like, and it'd be like, you know, Led Zeppelin, whole lot of love. I'm like, what, where did this kid come from? Like, he's from a different planet. He's an old soul. But, yeah. but I will say to you, um, I did have the conversation with him, you know, leading up to like his junior year in high school, we started looking at music schools and I'm like, Here, here's the deal. You can go to college and major in commercial guitar. I'm like, but that's not a great return on investment you know so why don't we think about you know the music industry is gigantic and yeah. there's so much opportunity i mean there is a business side of it so you know why don't you think about maybe a, a major in music business or yeah. audio engineering or something where like you can yeah. actually have a career and earn a living you know and then in parallel you're still you know i i'd say i attribute it to like coaching versus being a professional athlete right it's like you yeah. can't be a if you can't make pro, then the next best option is coaching and yeah. you know, tough living, but you know, you can make it and do really well. Yeah. Similar in, in the music industry, right? Like if you want to be, you want to be a rock star, great. I fully support it, but let's, let's try and, you know, get a return on, on your, you know, studies here, you know, yeah. so it's not cheap. So if you right. can at least graduate and be able to pay your bills, so I don't have to support you anymore, then I'm happy. So that. <laughs> So that was the deal we made. And yeah. he, he was mature enough to understand and agree that he should probably get a, a real degree. So, so music business and production, I think, you know, his, his uh, and he really wants to be a producer. He's, he's, I don't think he aspires to be a rock star, but. Okay. Well, man, he can be, I mean, he can produce for a rock star and still get all kinds of accolades and, and not live on daddy's payroll. You know what I mean? So That's you're right. good. Yeah, well, that's, uh, well, daddy big shout out. Him, he, he knows daddy would cut him off at some point. So, <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a deep conversation, maybe for another day. Is is parenting, especially in this day and age, man? I, I you know, now my kids are getting a little older and having to make some decisions on that. But, uh, man, talk about a job. That's the hardest job in the world is being a parent and raising good kids. But um, I, I'd imagine you're doing a phenomenal job, just like you are in business, Miguel. And so, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Nothing but. Uh, best wishes for 10x and you the family um any any other good messages for the listeners out there any quotes any words of wisdom i i will first i want to say thank you to you as well and congrats on all your success i appreciate um you reaching out and having me on on your podcast it's it's truly an honor and um and i also you know want to say congratulations to your wife i follow her on on linkedin as well and she's building you know a great career on the real estate side so yeah it's um, been crazy yeah, you got you guys are, are uh, you know, doing doing the right thing for your kids as well. So I'm sure they're wow. going to grow up to be successful uh, following, you know, mom and dad's lead for sure. Well, I'm, I'm humbled to hear that. And uh, and I like to say I walk in my wife's shadows now. She, she's she got way more followers on LinkedIn. 
you know, I think, you know, the, the, the financial stuff will come around, but she's planting some major seeds and building a huge structure uh, to build the castle on. And yeah, the real estate game for anyone out there who's like thinking about it, it is a long game. She feels every day like she's working minimum wage. She's actually at our rental house right now or Airbnb uh because uh the the washing machine it was not draining water so she's playing mechanic right now and youtubing videos on how to fix a freaking washing machine and that was not the plan but she's got someone coming in tomorrow and she needs to fix the damn washing machine so it's like you just never know man well <laughs> so, nothing, yeah. wrong, nothing wrong with that with her taking the lead on on number of followers um <laughs> but i think it's great i think it's great you guys have built in collectively built up a nice business individually and yeah uh, and for each other so it's good stuff it's, it's nice yeah no it, it's been fun man but i appreciate that i'm humbled to hear that and, and again i'm super grateful uh for everyone out there make sure you connect with miguel what i'll do is i'll put his linkedin link in the show notes um i'll put the uh their website which is always on each post that we do with the podcast has 10x on there you've recognized the logo i'm sure of it um but yeah check them out um, and again, for everyone out there, let's always make sure we're approaching the energy landscape with a radically open mind. Be kind and always remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody. Amen. Thanks, brother. Have you ever thought about what a podcast could do for your B2B business? Well, you might be surprised by the benefits it could offer. Firstly, podcasts provide an amazing opportunity to establish your brand as an industry thought leader. By sharing your insights, experiences, and expert opinions, you position yourself as an authority, gaining the trust and the respect of your audience. Secondly, hosting a podcast is a fantastic way to engage your customers on a deeper level. It's not just about promoting your products and services, it's about providing value through engaging content, fostering strong relationships, and loyalty among your listeners. Oh, and did I mention networking? Yes, that's a huge part. Podcasts are an incredible networking tool. When you interview guests from your industry, you're not only creating valuable content, but you're also building relationships that can lead to future partnerships and collaborations. But we know starting a podcast can feel daunting. I've had several people reach out to me lately asking how to create a podcast, and that's where I'm going to try and come in and help. I'm here to help you navigate the podcast world. Reach out to me for a 15-minute call where we can discuss your podcasting ambitions. Whether you're starting from scratch or simply looking to improve your existing show, I'm here to help. And guess what? I have a playbook too, a step-by-step -step guide to launching a successful podcast, and I can't wait to share it with you. This playbook has everything from topic brainstorming to technical setup to effective promotion strategies, all the essentials for a thriving podcast. So why wait? Get in touch today and let's embark on this podcasting journey together. After all, your voice deserves to be heard. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Wicked Energy with JG. And look, if you or your organization wants to start a podcast, please visit my website and sign up for a free guide on how to start a successful podcast. Once you get through it, let me know if you have any questions or getting started. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Peace.